good morning or afternoon or evening or whatever time you're watching this. Thank you for coming today without too much ado, because we got to get right down to it. Today we are going to be prepping for Tales from the Loop, roleplay Tales from the Loop. Uh, so it's a one shot that we're going to be doing uh, on Saturday afternoon. June 3rd, uh, June 3rd, 2017. And uh, I picked this game because it seemed like it would do really well for a one shot. And it hits a lot of really kind of universal touchstones for the people that uh, I will be playing with. Um, the cast is going to be um, Aurelian and me. Obviously, I'm going to be GMing it. Um, Austin Walker, who I know and love and don't get to play games with nearly enough. Um, my friend and, uh, new GM to Twitch, uh, Tycho, AKA Jerry Holkins from Penny Arcade. Um, and then, uh, old man wheat, who I believe was born in 1886. So he'll be playing a character a hundred years younger than him, which I think is exciting for him as a, um, you know, as a, as a player, I think he's really looking forward to that. So this game is like a little bit, I, I would say it's a little bit of a, it was a little bit of an indie game in terms of like, it's released by a company. So it's not really independent. Um, it was developed by and, and released by a, a company of designers. Um, it's produced by, mm, what are they called? Mope something. Modifus, Modifius. Free League is the, is the group that made it. It was published by Modifius. Um, and it's based on the art of a particular, uh, of a particular, uh, artist and, uh, well here, let me, let me, let me show you a better view of some of this great art, but look at that. So it's a, it's a Swedish game. Um, and it was originally inspired by this, this art that you can now find in the book. And it's set in kind of an alternate eighties. Um, the main book has two settings. It has a Sweden setting and it has a Boulder, Colorado setting, Boulder City, maybe Colorado City. Anyway, I don't want to play either of those because I'm not from Sweden and I'm not from America. Um, I mean, OK, fair. I'm not from Ontario either, but my dad is. And I, I think that Thunder Bay, Ontario is a nice sort of mid kind of midpoint. It's on the it's on the shores of the Great Lakes. Uh, it's got a kind of middle American vibe. And because I'm from Canada, uh, I can fill it with little Canadianisms like Tim Hortons and. Ottawa Senators jerseys. So, um, yeah, the premise of the game, um, let me, let me read it to you. Uh, I got the PDF here. I'm going to read you. I'll read you the general premise of the game. So in this game, a story is called a mystery It deals oh, surprise. Speaking of mysteries. Hello, Edvorn. Uh, this game, in this game, a story is called a mystery. It deals with a group of friends who try to solve mysteries together. The friends are kids aged 10 to 15 years old living in the late 1980s. Everyday life is full of nagging parents, never ending homework and classmates bullying and being bold, bullied. The mysteries allow the kids to encounter strange machines and creatures that exist as the result of the nearby loop, capital L, a huge underground particle accelerator built in the 1960s. The kids get to escape their everyday lives and problems and be part of something meaningful and magical, yet also dangerous. They risk getting injured and also changed by the trouble they have to overcome to solve the mysteries. So, Part of what the game suggests is setting a loop in your own hometown. And and Vancouver, I feel like, is... I don't know. I I guess I could set it in Kelowna, where I grew up. But I wanted to pick somewhere that's a little more like Canadian Canada. West Coast Canada is, like, a bit warmer than you might expect. And, like, I like the idea of this sort of Middle America style, like, plain old... Ah, thank you, Leafington. The Senators didn't make it back to Ottawa till the 90s. So, I don't know. The Winnipeg Jets jerseys, then. The Jets are lousy, anyway. I'm putting that down. Winnipeg Jets. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through kind of some of the steps that I do when I learn a new game. Because I've I've read the rule book. I haven't played Tales from the Loop before. Um, but I'll, I'll walk through some of the steps that I take when I learn a new game. And we'll talk about what the game wants me to do as a game master. And then we'll try to see what kind of prep we need to do to get ready for uh, our one-shot mystery uh, set in, in this world of the loop. 
in, in Thunder, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, so fans of the, of the show who've been kind of engaging with role play stuff, uh, on the community site, uh, have given me some awesome cultural touchstones. I've been listening to the, uh, hits of 1986, uh, on, on my cassette tape player, uh, the last little while. There are a lot of songs, both good and terrible that came out in 1986. Uh, would you like me to tell you some? Cause I will. Let me, let me give you some names from this playlist. See, I'd just play them for you, but copyright law does not allow for me to do this. But imagine in your mind, if you will, a beautiful summer punctuated by such hits as Living on a Prayer, Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel, Say You, Say Me by Lionel Richie. Actually, I really like that song. Um, True Colors by Cyndi Lauper, uh, Manic Monday by The Bangles, West End Girls by The Pet Shop Boys. Top Gun came out this year, so both Take My Breath Away by Berlin and Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins belong on that list. Small Town by John Mellencamp. A personal favorite of mine, Your Love by The Outfield. The Final Countdown by Europe. Just so much good, so much good stuff. So I've been listening to these things just to kind of get my head into it, but the song, the pièce de résistance for me was that in 1986, Raining Blood by Slayer was released, which means Raining Blood contains the song Rain In Blood, which is my fucking favorite Slayer song. Yes, it's so fucking good. So someone, someone in this game, I'm going to put down here right next to Winnipeg Jets, I'm going to put Slayer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it in the correct fashion. Slayer. Raining Blood from a lacerated sky. Raining Blood. So, yeah. Horns out for Slayer. So that's the thing that happened in 1986. There's a bunch of really good movies that came out in 1986. Um, for example, Big Trouble in Little China came out in 1986. Uh, 1986 is a great, it's a great, it's a great year in which to set a game. And so this is the kind of thing that I like about playing his historical games. It's a historical sci-fi game, but w there's this thing, there's this block of, of content of like 86 is right in the middle of the, Welcome of the eighties, right? It, it hits that eighties space so well. So, uh, you know, I'll probably put together maybe afterwards a, a soundtrack listing of, of songs inspired me, but you know, raining blood's going to be on that shit. So, Let's talk about the game. So what, what I like about Tales from the Loop, uh, let's, this, I'll talk about the system first, then we'll talk about what the game wants us to do. Because the game actually tells you. It isn't just, here's some rules for, for resolving stuff. It specifically lays out, here's what the principles of this game are. This is what we want you to do. And these are rules for the players to engage in, as well as the GM. So mechanically, uh, the Tales from the Loop, uses a pool of d6s so you, you build up a pool of d6s uh and it's based on the rating for how good you are at stuff and then you roll all of those and if you get a six you it's a success you occasionally very rarely will need more than one six to succeed uh if you fail you can push yourself to try again, but you will get hurt upset or scared when you when you do so so it's a bit like blades in the dark um I like that it gives it gives the players the option to decide if they push themselves uh, or not. And that's it. I don't have to set difficulty numbers. I just say, okay, I think trying to use this mysterious machine to control this walking robot, uh, go ahead and, and make a roll based on your, your stats. Let's pop up one of the character sheets so you can take a look at them. Um, you can see like, here's your attributes and your skills, right? So I think it would require like a sneak roll or a force roll or a program roll. And so, you know, maybe you've got three points in that. And there you go. So it shows you, normally you'd have a stat to go with it. And look, I got one success and we can see that I got, I got my die. So that's a success. If you don't have enough successes, you can either push yourself, which makes you take a condition, which is like in mouse guard, like angry, scared, exhausted, injured, or broken. Broken being the last one. Each one of these reduces your die pool by one. So you get, as you get beat up uh, in game, you, you kind of lose those things. And uh, yeah, you can push yourself to reroll. Now, 
characters, the younger characters will have luck points. And luck points allow you essentially to push yourself without taking condition, but you only get so many of them between sessions. And since we're only doing one session, that's it. And that's pretty much the rules, right? There are a few rules for recovery. You use your anchor, there's iconic items, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but it's a fairly simple, straightforward game. And I think that it leans itself pretty well for one shot. So we're gonna talk about what it takes to GM this game. Now, Tales from the Loop has what are called principles of the loop. Uh, the Tales from the Loop role-playing game is permeated by six principles that the players in the Game Master will use to create stories with the right kind of feeling and plot. Makes sense, right? These are Apocalypse World style. This is the game telling us. This is how you can make the game feel like this. And I'm going to need to internalize these, these, these rules, and so will my players. So the principles of the loop are, one, your hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. So this means that in this world, you don't need to go far to see cyborgs, robots, flying vehicles, uh, strange creatures wandering the land, uh, time dilation. These things exist in your hometown. Uh, this kind of magic that has been made possible by the, uh, the particle acceleration of the loop uh, are now available to, to the kids in this game. So we can encounter those things without having to leave Thunder Bay, Ontario, 1986. Uh, number two, everyday life is dull and unforgiving. So everyday life is dull and unforgiving means the alarm clock rings every morning and homework must be done every night. It doesn't matter that the magnetrine ships sail by the outside window, that mom and dad still fight, your brother seems to hate you, the house smells fishy and you don't get enough pocket money to buy the tape you want, the garbage has to be thrown out, bullies give you nicknames, and your bike is broken. It's raining and you have no raincoat. Life is full of setbacks and obstacles. So this is the contrast to the world is full of exciting stuff because of the loop, but it hasn't changed the fundamental lives of the people in the setting, right? The loop hasn't been around forever, and we haven't got these technologies that really change our lives, but fundamentally, as a GM and as players, we have to acknowledge that what this game is really about is the dichotomy between the world of the everyday. Like, I don't care if you were up all night sneaking out, running around in the woods, trying to figure out the mystery. It's got a kind of Buffy-esque vibe to it, right? Like, there's this sort of feeling of you're balancing the fact that you're a kid and kids, ultimately, what are you going to do? Like, if your mom and dad say, go to school, you have a curfew, come home, you're, you're a kid. You have to abide by those rules, right? And I'm going to have to rely on the players to play kids, not to play adults pretending to be kids, right? They have to think about, like, what would a kid do in this kind of, yeah, the light fantastic versus the childhood mundane. I like it. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. So everyday life is dull and forgiving. Our hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. Third, adults are out of reach and out of touch. This is a big one. So adults are out of reach and out of touch. It doesn't matter what you say. Adults neither listen nor understand. They live in their own world distinct from the kids. There's no point in asking them for help with your problems, mysteries to be solved, or troubles that must be overcome. The kids are at the mercy of each other. The adults won't even believe in the strange things the kids encounter. The adults nag, whine, and argue with each other. They're busy with themselves and their work. Moreover, they're ignorant. It's usually their mistakes the kids need to fix. Machines that run amok, experiments gone bad, aircraft that crash or explode. The worst are the adults who actually see the kids and want to exploit or harm them. Sometimes adults help, like when your dad comforts you or you call the police and they catch the burglars, but it never lasts and often comes with a price. The police take all the glory, your stepmom wants you to mow the lawn all summer as payment for help, or your teacher sees you an ally and expects you to help keep your eye on the bad guys in class. Adults are out of reach and out of touch. Everyday life is dull and unforgiving. Your hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. The land of the loop is dangerous, but kids will not die. Mechanically, this is reinforced. The kids cannot die. They can be hurt. They can be locked up. They can be mocked, displaced, robbed, or brokenhearted, but they cannot die in this game. 
Now, they're not immortal because they aren't kids anymore. Adults can die, right? Notice that it only says the kids will not die. And kids in this is capitalized K. They mean the PCs in this game. Other kids might die, right? That would be a cause of hurt and brokenhearted fear for the players. But the players' kids cannot die. I can't be like, you get hit by a truck and killed, right? You can't, that's not a thing that, that, that can happen to these characters. So for us, we can risk instead brokenheartedness. We can risk fear and sadness. We can watch our parents divorce. We can get ourselves into danger and know that we'll never be anything worse than like hospitalized, right? Like we might've ended up in the hospital, but it's not like we're going to lose our characters, which gives us a nice space to, to take risks with them. Five. The game is played scene by scene. Now, this is where we start talking about the game itself. So just like in the movies, the mystery is played in scenes. First, the characters talk to each other in the house. Then we skip to when they meet their teacher at school. Don't play out every little step they take on the way between home and school. Skip the boring parts. Skip the less important parts. In Tales from the Loop, the game master is the one who sets the scenes. Now, this is, this is very much straight out of like indie role-playing games, right? Like, this is... Scene framing as a discipline from small press games that we've been doing this for a long time. Um, the game master sets scenes on his or her own initiative. When you come home at night, you hear someone crying in the kitchen. Your father is sitting at the table. When he sees you, he wipes his tears and puts on a fake smile. What do you do? Right? Setting a scene means to initiate it and end it when it seems done. So it's going to be my job to set the scene and break the scene. To be like, all right, I think we're done. Let's move on right? The game master can also ask the players to suggest which scene should be set. A good rule of thumb is to allow the players to set every other scene. So for example, you can ask your players, hey, does anybody have a scene they want? Do you want to, someone else want to set the scene? So this allows me to turn over the, the work to say, okay, so um, Wheat, your character and Aaron's character, uh, maybe your, your siblings, do you want to set a scene in your house after all this bad stuff happens? I'd love to see the two of you coping with this, right? So lastly, the world, this is great too. The world is described collaboratively. So I'm going to read this one. The game master is responsible for setting scenes and describing things in the story, but it doesn't mean she should do all the work herself. The game master should ask the players for help all the time. Ask them what the school looks like, what the weather is, why the neighbors are arguing, and so forth. The game master should ask the kids questions. What does your mother look like? What's fishy about the lady of the house next door? What is the mood in the house when you get home? How do you feel? What are you thinking? What have you done that makes them hate you? What are you wearing? How come you love her? The game master can use the player's imagination by asking questions all the time and making sure the group builds this world together. If the players make up flying schools and parents who work as alien hunters, the game master should remind them of the principle, everyday life is dull and unforgiving. The strange and mysterious should be in the mysteries. The game master has final say. This, again, is very much like Dungeon World or Apocalypse World. It's going to be my job to say, what's your favorite class? Jerry's character. And Jerry will be like, drama. And I'm like, okay, why? Describe your drama class to me. What does the room look like? Who else is in your class? What's this? Like, why do you like it? I like that these principles are player and GM principles. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through them one more time. And I'm going to write them down so that I can cement them in my head. So home is full of strange and fantastic things. So that's rule number one. Number two, everyday life is dull and forgiving. Dull and forgiving. Okay, cool. Three, adults are out of reach and out of touch. <laughs> adults out of reach and touch. I love that one. That one's maybe my, my favorite. It's the one, honestly, like this whole game could just be about like how shitty it is to be a kid sometimes with punctuated scenes of wonder and excitement with giant robots and dinosaurs and stuff. But ultimately what I, what I really like is that idea of like, mom, mom, you wouldn't believe what happened today. I don't have time for this shit, kid. Like being an adult is hard and it, it <laughs> grinds you down. But we're not seeing it from the adults' point of view. We're seeing it from the kids. 
Okay. Uh, the land kids will not die. That's an easy one. To remember the mechanics do that for us. A kind five. Gesture. Aw, thanks, Airwave Girl. Yeah, I'm really excited too. Um, when I saw this, one of my first thoughts was we have to get DJ Weed on this because it replicates movies and, and TV shows. And I know, I just know that Weed is going to bring it. I hear Aaron made her character, uh, Aurelian made her character, and oh shit. <laughs> I hear she's going to be really good. She's cosplaying for it too, which is so good. Uh, okay, and then scene by scene. And lastly, the world is collaborative. World is collab. Okay. So we've we've learned that. Yeah, she got some glasses and a sweater and like a scrunchie and, and she was telling me about her characters. She's she's the only one who's like really like she's basically fully made her character, which is exciting. Okay, so the age of the loop. Some stuff we need to remember is um, it's pretty much like uh, ET or the Goonies or War Games or Stranger Things. Uh, you know, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Slayer, <laughs> Commodore sixty four, the VCR. Uh, you know, we're we're out of we're out of the seventies now. We're fully into the eighties, uh, and we will be until the early nineties. Um, but things are not exactly how we remember them, right? We have this thing called the loop and the loop has given us all kinds of mysterious technologies that are available. But what's cool here is that our part of our goal as the GM is to depict those things as being mundane as well. So like if a hover vehicle drives through town, right? People are not going to stare and, and be, uh, uh, think that it's out of, out of the ordinary, right? The interesting thing that it talks about here is keep in mind that when we're seeing a huge Gauss ship cruise above the ground, it's still an awe-inspiring sight for the kids. It's not something magical or fantastical. It's not science fiction. At its heart, this game is about growing up in the shadows of strange things and solving mysteries, about being a kid. Really, the the fun technological stuff is for us as players to to kind of be interested in and play around with. So... Yeah, I mean, we don't need to worry too much about like setting stuff because we kind of know like it's the 80s, but there's some like weird, cool technology that's that's available to uh, to people uh, in the uh, in the game. Now, if you're interested in learning really specifically, like more details about what's in these loops, the US loop and the Sweden loop and kind of how they're depicted, um, definitely pick up at least the PDF of the game. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, lots of amazing art. Really, really good art. Um, so. Part of what's going to happen is I'm going to have to adapt the game. Whatever we build, whatever mystery we build, I'm going to have to adapt it and make it personal. And I'm going to have to do that using the characters that get created. So the kids are going to choose. The kids are going to choose uh, from, from an archetype. And we're not going to linger on this too much because I want to do some of it at the beginning of play. Because obviously I don't know what these characters are going to be. But the archetypes are the bookworm, who's good at calculating, investigating, and comprehending. Also, think about if you were if you as a kid were in this, which one of these would you be? Okay. Bookworm, computer geek who can calculate, program and comprehend. Remember, being a computer geek in 1986 is very different from being one now. Uh, the hick who's good at force, move and tinker. Uh, the jock, force, move and contact. So they're like kind of a popular kid, but not the popular kid. Because the other option is the popular kid, contact, charm, and lead. The rocker. Fuck yeah, the rocker. Move, charm, and empathize. The troublemaker, who's good at force, sneak, and lead. Or the weirdo, sneak, investigate, and empathize. So lots of great options, right? Weirdo, troublemaker, rocker, popular kid, jock, hick, computer geek, or bookworm. So we're going to have four of those. And uh, they'll be between the ages of 10 and 15. Um, I, God, when I was, it, when I was a teenager, I was probably, <laughs> I was either the bookworm or the computer geek, probably. I didn't get to be the weirdo till I was like the rocker or the weirdo until I was like, 16 or 17 till I was barely a kid anymore. Yeah. So they'll all have relationships, anchors, pride, and drive, but I don't know what those are now, so we're not going to linger on them right now. 
The last thing we'll do as a group, and I'm gonna make a note to do this sort of second. So character creation, we'll start there. Hammer out the details for everyone who hasn't finished their character. Thankfully, Erin can help me with this because she knows. And then uh, the kids have a hideout together where they can be alone and safe. The player should agree on what their hideout is and where it's located. The game master may not let NPCs find the hideout unless the kids show it to them. Think about that. Think about that as a statement in a role-playing game, right? It's telling me as the game master, this game is brave, right? Because a lot of games are too scared to just tell the GM what they are and aren't allowed to do. The GM is specifically not allowed to put you in trouble in the hideout or show the, uh, show the hideout to any NPCs unless the kids do that. So the kids can hide there and they can be safe. Isn't that cool? I think that's so cool. So after everyone has created a kid and before the game starts, the GM asks a number of questions to the kid and to the group. And we'll figure out what our hideout is. So the Game Master chooses four to six questions from the list and distributes them uh, to the kids and two to three addressed to the whole group. So some of these are going to be for me to build that the last three hours to build in some personalization. Now, if I was feeling bold, and I don't know, maybe I will be, we could just wing it for three hours. I've done it before, I'll do it again. I'm gonna be doing a lot of it, <laughs> but uh, I, can, I, can, I can wing it based on these questions, but I'm also gonna see what tools the game gives me. So here are some questions, some, some opportunities, things to ask the characters. And these are like the kinds of thing like an adult or a, um, you know what I'm thinking of? You know what character or what show I'm thinking of that, that maybe we haven't mentioned yet is Freaks and Geeks. When was Freaks and Geeks set? Like early 80s, right? Freaks and Geeks, yeah, 80, 81. Yeah. So pretty early on, not, not necessarily 80s. I would call Freaks and Geeks almost like a late 70s show. But um, my favorite character on Freaks and Geeks is uh is the 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 long-haired um <sighs> guidance counselor god i love that guy um and these are the kinds of questions he might ask these kids right but for me my, my job here is to ask like what do your parents do for work what's your favorite food do you have any siblings how do you feel about your siblings do you like them uh, what does your room look like? What do you dream about? What makes you angry? Where do you want to work when you grow up? What do you think about sports? What are your experience with the robots in your town? Um, what's the farthest you've ever traveled? Have you been to like Europe? Um, how often do you go to America? We'll look at a map of Thunder Bay in just a minute so you can see where it is. Mr. Rosso, that was his name. So good. Um, and then I can ask the group, who in the group has the most to say? What makes you laugh? What secrets do you have? Who dislikes you as a group? Who wants to be in your gang, but they're not allowed? Why? Uh, what are you currently fighting about? Who in this group is in love with whom? What sets you apart from the other kids? What are you not talking about? What do you like to do best? I cannot wait to hear what these characters, like what they're like as kids, right? Like this stuff for me is so much fun. So I'm gonna do that. So we'll do character creation, we'll do the hideout thing, we'll do questions, and then and then the mystery, right? Now in this game, uh, anything that needs to be overcome is called trouble with a capital T. Trouble is when you roll. You don't roll if it's not trouble. If it's trouble, you have to roll. It's the game master's job to create trouble, but the kids can get themselves into trouble. They can choose to throw themselves into something troublesome that might happen. So a player might set a scene where they're in trouble. Troubles can be things like one of the bullies throws a bottle at you. Mom refuses to let you go out tonight. Your parents start arguing again. Um, your classmates don't believe you. The robot attacks you with its claw. A portal opens with a deafening roar and everything in the room is sucked towards it. Right? All, all of those things are troubles and you need to roll to overcome them. Uh, if you fail your roll, you don't overcome them. You might take a condition. You can also roll again and take a condition to uh, to deal with that. Um, I can warn them if there's going to be a trouble, right? I can say, if you don't overcome this trouble, you will take this condition, right? Uh, your big brother tries to wrestle you down in front of your whole class of classmates. You risk being upset. If you can't squirm free, everyone will laugh at you you will take the upset condition. There's a little bit of like pre-Monster Heart stuff in here, right? These conditions, um, because they, they reflect things that happen to your characters that aren't just, you take five damage. You know, you notice if you look at the character sheet, there's no hit points, right? 
it's a very simple character sheet. We just have the conditions. So it's really all we have to worry about. I'll leave this up in case you want to take a look at it as we play. So yeah, you can spend a luck point. Another thing that's really cool, here's a here's a fun little trick that, that worked in the game. You get a number of luck points equal to 15 minus your age. When the character becomes 16, they're not allowed to play anymore, right? On your 16th birthday, you grow out of being a kid. You're not a kid anymore. Um, if you're 10, you start the game with five luck points. Your stats are not as good, but you get more luck points. And then, yeah, so... You can spend these luck points to to reroll. You can't save them between sessions. They just they just bump up as you go. I think that's a great little mechanic. Um, you uh, some skills let you ask questions of the GM. No problem. That's basic stuff. Um, you can buy additional effects with your skills. Now here's the other cool thing about how rolls work. So let me let me make a roll. Let's say I've got uh, I'm making like a I don't know a tech roll, and we're making a tinker roll here. Let's see. Oh, I only got one success. Okay. Well, I'm not very good at this, but if I had more successes, right? If I had two successes, one gets me success. An additional one will let me buy effects based on the skill that I'm using. So every skill has bonus effects. So Tinker, for example, um, and I think this is so cool. This is such a great little mechanism. So Tinker uh, allows me to make things that are more durable, make things do stuff that is more than, more than I expected, uh, give bonuses to the things that I'm making. Um, you can use every skill to get you additional stuff, bonus effects, if you get more, uh, more sixes. Cool, huh? So yeah, um, so you have all your stats and your skills and that's character level stuff, that's player stuff. So my job is to create a mystery, capital M mystery for the game. So a mystery is a scenario for the kids to play, like a comic book or a TV show episode. A mystery has characters and plots for the players to uncover. Unlike these, a mystery has no set chain of events, which turns the story it takes and how it ends up depends on the choices the kids make and to some extent on chance. So there's four in the game and I could have just gone with a pre-built one, but I wanted to sit down with you. And I, I think that building these things helps us better understand the system. So let's take a look at what the tools for building a mystery. Building a mystery. Speaking of crappy Canadian history, um, we're going to try to build a history, a mystery for these people. And the truth of the mystery is the first thing that we need to do. What is the story about? So the game asks us, what do we, what do we think? Do we want this to be a human error mystery, a conflict mystery, or a mischief mystery? Okay, I'm going to read the descriptions and we can talk about which ones seem more interesting to us. A human error mystery is about people's inability to manage the great things they've created. This is the like, no, my hubris, right? Scientist has created a time machine that has thrown back an area of town into the Stone Age. A hole in the fabric of time has opened and dinosaurs wander in and out. Um, the result of an unsuccessful animal experiment has been flushed down the drain and grown to become a monster in the lake. Ooh. Uh, a creature from another time or place is stranded by the loop and needs help to return home. A kind of like Harry and the Henderson situation. How are we going to get Johnny the Sasquatch back to the Ice Age? Right? These are fun. I think these are cute. Um, a human a human error one is someone has screwed up and now the kids have to fix or un unfold it. Okay? So that's human error. Conflicts are about the tension between two or more parties that want opposite things and want to fight to get what they want. Soviet or American industrial spies try to steal the secrets of the loop. Uh, a student who hates his teacher tries to just take revenge by using his tech skills. A robot is on the run and its owners want to catch it. The robot one is so tempting, but I don't want to play Pi again, right? Like, I don't want to do that, but like my pet robot where they're like, oh no, this robot escaped from a facility. And maybe we'll do it with like a dinosaur or something. Maybe we'll do it like an intelligent dino, their, their friend T-Rex which I also think is like a bad 80s. I mean, Encino Man, right? Anyway, so conflict is about um, criminals using technology to steal from the town. Uh, a dinosaur hunter and a Tyrannosaurus Rex use a local forest as their battleground. Um, Mojahideen come to the loop to steal or buy technology to fight against the Soviet invasion. Environmentalists, ooh, want to sabotage the fusion reactor. Oh my God, an intelligent octopus. <laughs> that's a little he's a little too fluid based i don't think octopi do well in cold climates especially the great lakes 
All right. So human error mystery. Someone screwed up and now the kids have to fix it. Conflict between two groups of adults usually and the, the kids are stuck in the middle or have to fix it. Or uh, mischief. Mischief is about other kids who create problems for fun. Teenagers steal a robot and bring it to a party, but things go off the rails. Someone is badly hurt. Uh, a kid finds a gap in the ground, which leads down to a maze of underground tunnels where he gets lost. Uh, teens use an invention to cheat on their tests. What do you think? I'm kind of thinking human error might be our might be our fun one. So let's let's start making notes. So mystery mystery type. I'm gonna actually no. I'm gonna make the notes. Y'all talk about it. I'm gonna make the notes where you can see them. Now you're working on building a mystery. God damn it. Oops. That's Sarah McLaughlin, right? That song. I just about wrote Sarah McLaughlin in this box. Okay, so here's our mystery screen. Uh, I'm just going to make it kind of gray so we can see what we're doing. And I think it's big enough. We don't need a grid for it. And I'll make it wider than it is tall so that we can use it like a screen and there we go okay so let's start working on this mystery i'm thinking human error might be fun i think that's probably where we're gonna go with this one mystery typo all right let's not let's not overthink it let's call it let's call it human Error mystery. Somebody, some adult goofed up. The find a monster and help it thing is pretty good too. I kind of like that one. So I don't know, maybe let's, let's make a little note about like, maybe friend monster situation. Cause that, I mean, that's a good three part arc, right? What's causing trouble? Oh shit, it's a monster. Let's save the monster by sending it back to its own dimension. It's like it's like Stranger Things, but if the Demogorgon was friend instead of foe. Massive maple syrup spill. Get the fuck out of here with your Canadian. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. So so yeah, I'm I'm kind of liking that one. I'm liking it. Some kind of monstrosity. Okay. So the next thing we need to think about, the narrative of the game consists of two parts, the mystery and everyday life. In one scene, they chase a runaway robot, but in the next, they try to stop their drunk dad from driving their car to work. Some scenes can be about the mystery and everyday life, right? High DT in your closet while drunk dad goes looking for his car keys. Um, I gotta tell you, like, you know me, I'm going to be as gentle about this stuff as possible, but I'm going to hit it hard. I'm going to go I'm going to go in on this stuff. We're we're not going to pretend like these kids have like nice lives. Th th this is going to be there's going to be problems. Um so, yeah, just keep in mind that that's that's a thing. Um Yeah, just a just a thing. Okay, so that's going to be those parts of the game, right? The, the, we'll go back and forth. But this is the thing is, I don't get to decide this. I don't get to. I don't get to be like your dad's an alcoholic. The players will give this to me. So if none of the players pick like really heavy stuff, it'll be a little lighter. But my job is going to be to listen to them when they when they say those things and work that into the game. So human error mystery. Some kind of like friend, friend monster. Okay. So you should bear in mind uh, what the answer to the questions you asked when the kids were created. Write down some ideas of what could happen. My whole first break is just going to be sitting like coming up with this stuff. So that'll be my, basically what I have to do is we'll come up with the, the grand sci-fi mystery, the plot of the movie. Then the players will bring me the complications and then in play, we'll improvise the heavy stuff. I think that'll be good. I think this will work nicely. Um... All right, so the mystery is, fa uh, is played in six phases. Oh my God, <laughs> if, it was, if it was a story about a werewolf, yes, it would be Tales of the Loop spelled L-O-U-P. Good, good job, Mads. Okay, uh, Stephen King is actually, someone in chat mentioned, dad's a drunk, throw in fundamentalist Christian, and this would be a Stephen King story. Stephen King is a big touchstone for this, uh, this game. They mention it in the, uh, in the book. 
Um, okay, so an overview of the mystery, six phases. Introducing the kids, introducing the mystery, solving the mystery, showdown, aftermath, change. So introducing the kid. Each kid, okay, here we go. I'm gonna start writing these down. So introduce kids. So I have to do that. So introduce kids. Each kid gets one scene of their own from everyday life with or without a trouble. One scene each. Okay, so that'll, like, like with dogs, everybody gets a little scene. Like, set the scene. Show me your kid in everyday life. Um, okay, introducing the mystery. So introduce mystery. And in the mystery, the kids encounter or discover something they start to investigate. So this is going to be like signs that monster friend. Uh, I, you know what? I got to write these down in a place we can all look at them. <laughs> Silly. Okay. All right. So one, introduce the kids. One scene each. Two, introduce the mystery. Something causing trouble. What is it? It's monster friend. Uh, three, solving the mystery. So this is going to be like most of the game, solving the misery. Eh, eh, there we go. And solving the mystery involves um, visit locations, discover clues, overcome trouble, while at the same time having to manage everyday life. This is the core of the mystery where most scenes take place. Okay. Four, showdown. So the showdown takes place. This is the climax. The kids have solved the mystery and try to stop what's happening in a dramatic scene where everything is at stake. Everything is at stake. Big dramatic climax. So this is quite a structured game, hey? Like, we don't take turns. Um, there's actually no turn order in this, but I quite like this. So... Yeah, um, we're going to go back and forth between solving the mystery, overcoming trouble, and your day-to-day -day stuff. Um, and then in five, aftermath, uh, mystery is solved. Mystery is solved. Uh, lives return to normal. So what I like about this is that the game deviates back to normalcy, right? The game deviates back to the kids' lives are mostly the same as before. Each kid gets one scene from everyday life. Each kid, one scene. This will kind of be our closer. And then six is change. Um, players get to change problems, items, prides, relationships, get XP. So this is like the reward structure of the game. So let's, let's find out what these kids are going to get XP for. What are the players in this game rewarded for? Players will get experience for... Let me see, because this is how you learn what a game is really about. Players will get experience points for participating. <laughs> Did you participate in the session? You get an experience point. Okay. Whatever. Two. Have you been in trouble because of your problem or your relationships? Ah, nice. So they're in they're 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 gonna get XP. I'm actually gonna write these down too, because I think that it's important to tell them in advance, hey, here's what you'll get XP for. Showing up. Two. Getting in trouble because of your relationships or problem. Three. Uh, struggling with your pride, struggling with, or using your pride. All this stuff from the character sheet. Okay. Um, put yourself at risk for the other kids. And lastly, learn something new. What is it? What is it? Okay. These are, these are just straight up like, this is Dungeon World style, right? Did we, did we discover a, a new and exciting thing about the world? Do we fight a monster? This is, this is great. This is just like basic, easy, simple, uncomplicated stuff. So uh, this thing, uh, I have to remember to tell my players, hey, yo, this is what we will give you experience points for at the end of the session. <laughs> All right. 
so let's take a quick look at what the phases are about. So during phase one, every mystery starts with each kid playing a scene from everyday life. This helps a player get to know her kid and shows the other players who her kid is. The game master can set a scene or the player can suggest one. The GM can get inspiration with the kid's problems, pride, and relationship. The general thing here is to choose the most obvious scene. The, the bookworm is getting bullied. The weirdo is being weird, right? The rocker is enjoying music and, and dealing with... So these are, these are easy. This will be, be nice and straightforward. Okay. So phase two, introducing the mystery. All I have to do is let the kids encounter or hear about something that arouses their curiosity. This usually happens in a single scene where all the kids are present, but can be stretched out to several scenes. So what... Hmm. Okay, let's, you know what, let's determine what the truth of our mystery is here. Uh, let's, let's settle this. So the truth of this mystery, I'm going to zoom out a little more and buy myself some more space. The truth of the mystery is, what do we think? Is this a genetically engineered creature? Is it a creature from out of time? What is it? My heart wants to go with Sasquatch because it's like kind of human, but I don't know. Maybe we can, maybe we can do better. What do we think? So here we go. Truth of the mystery a human, uh, a creature is, has escaped from the loop where bad stuff was happening to it. It's far from home. Maybe it's from another dimension. I don't know. We haven't figured it out yet. I need to make my screen a little bigger. Let's go 50 wide. Boop. There we go. Uh, it's far from home and needs the kids to get it back there. So, yeah. Like I like, I like like Sasquatch or like Jim Henson style puppet. Yeah, it would definitely be, it would definitely be <laughs> Peter Mansbridge, the human bridge hybrid. No, very Canadian. I also think that the Sasquatch is very, it's very Canadian, right? Because remember, this is set in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I kind of, oh man, I kind of love, I think I'm going to go with Sasquatch. My heart feels Sasquatch. Because they're big and furry and kind of dopey. Yeah. And it could be like a, a, a Neanderthal. Like we're hitting a Harry and the Hendersons slash Encino Man kind of vibe. Yeah. Mostly werewolves, Sasquatches, some kind of, yep. Okay. All right. A strange ape man creature has escaped from the loop. And it was it was kidnapped. Where where should it have come from? Um is it just like from the wilderness, or do they have to take it to a specific dangerous place to return it? Yeah, like it's gotta be a smart enough Sasquatch to like talk to them. Sort of. Like I don't think it can speak. I think it can like grunt and scratch its head and it loves, you know, snack food. They gotta bring it Twinkies and stuff. It's hiding out in the woods. That, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And it was, yes, exactly. It was captured and they were, they were testing it. Uh, it was being experimented on and it needs to, uh, it needs to get like, yeah, it needs to get back to, to the like, but so what's, what's preventing it? Oh, oh my gosh. Do they have to, do they have to rescue? Do they have to rescue? It's, it's, it's mate or it's kids. It's Sasquatch girlfriend. Oh, that would be so good. They have to save Lady Sasquatch. And she, she's got a little bow in her head. Oh, my God. So they have to infiltrate. The kids have to sneak into the facility. They have to free Mrs. Sasquatch. And then the two of them can run off into the woods together. Oh, my God. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, so it escaped from the loop where it was being experimented on. And now the kids need to help it save its mate and then mr and mrs sasquatch squatch can return to the canadian wilderness oh my god it's so heartwarming <laughs> all right the squatchmo family um i was being ironic about the the bow in her hair it was a miss pac-man joke don't worry about it uh okay cool all right. Uh, so great. They're gonna save. They're gonna save the the Squatchmos, and they're gonna return them to the Sam's the Sam's Quench Wilderness. Uh, 
<laughs> oh my god, this is so good. Uh, awesome. The future of the, the Sasquatch race depends on these human children. <laughs> oh, it's so heartwarming. Oh, yeah. So what's going to be great, what's going to be great is there's going to be a, a literal giant hairy ape man. But if someone's dad is like difficult or pig headed, he's going to act like the Sasquatch. And there will be rife opportunities for the Sasquatch in the shot behind the dad where dad is like, oh, like yelling and like shaking his hands at the TV. And the Sasquatch is like, like pounding his chest in the background, getting really excited about CFL. Oh, yeah. Yes. I'm so about this. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, there'll be a Tim Hortons. Don't you worry. I'm going to write that. I'm writing down Tim Hortons and CFL. What's the Thunder Bay CFL team in 1986? Let me look it up. Thunder Bay Canadian Football League 1986. Google says the Thunder Bay. No, the Hornets were a hockey team. This is the problem with Canada. We have such a Thunder Bay CFL. Do they have a CFL team? The Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The Ottawa Rough Riders. Maybe Thunder. Oh, here we go. Junior football for the Thunder Bay Giants. Minor league football. It doesn't look like the CFL had a, a Thunder Bay team in that, that time. But the CFL, the Grey Cup. Oh, yeah. CFL, Grey Cup hockey it's all yep if this sasquatch if this sasquatch doesn't end up in a in a winnipeg jets jersey so help me god so there's gonna be a scene for sure with like trying to sneak the sasquatch into like a grocery store where he'll have like ray-bans on and a and a jersey and they'll be like this is my cousin he's from chicago <laughs> oh i'm so excited i'm so excited about the sasquatch situation Hamilton Tiger Cats. All right. So that's the truth of the mystery. Uh, the a Sasquatch has escaped. Sasquatch has escaped from the loop where it was being experimented on. Now the kids have to help it save its mate so the Squatchmos can return to the wilderness. What What's a good 80s food? What's a good 80s food that the Sasquatch loves? What's a thing that the Sasquatch is like super into? 80s snack foods. Let's look them up. 80s snack food. What's a popular snack food in the 80s? Uh, let's see. Smurf Berry Crunch, Flintstones Push Up Pops, Shark Bite Fruit Snacks, Squeeze It's, Jello Puddin' Pops. Though I, I want to stay away from that, I think. Keebler Magic. M Ooh, Nintendo Cereal. Yeah, I feel like. Man, High C. Ooh, delicious. Tang. I guess Tang's pretty 70. Yeah, tab fun dip. <laughs> I kind of like, yeah, Flintstones push pops. Oh, man, I remember shark bites. Those are delicious. The tiger shark fruit snack inside. All right. All right, I like it. <laughs> Crystal Pepsi. <laughs> Timbits, bugles. Yeah, see, there's all these, there's all lots of options. All right, so anyway, um, let's... Let's take a look at what we need to do in the guts of the of the mystery. So for the mystery, what I need to do is we figured out the truth of it. We need to think about um, introducing the mystery. So the beginning of the mystery is going to be like what's the, the, the Sam, the Sam Squanch is causing some trouble. It's escaped. And the probably the police are like, ma'am, we've had some reports of, um, you know, uh, a, a mysterious you know, sightings out in the woods. We think, you know, it might be, there might be some, there's a hobo camp out there. Uh, you know, keep an eye on your dogs. Uh, maybe it's wolves or, or a bear, right? So let's, let's think about some clues that, that are in that, that early phase where we don't know it's a Sasquatch yet, right? Introducing the mystery. What is it? Uh, phase one. So intro to mystery. We just need to think of like a, a scene or two where we can show the kids. The kids are the only ones that get to see the Sasquatch. So yeah, huge footprints uh, near the hideout, depending on where it is. I hope it's in the woods. Huge footprints near the hideouts, uh, missing pets. So people, the, the, the gotcha here will be like, not eaten, 
but beloved. So when we when we find the Sam Squanch, he's got everybody's missing like dog and cat, and he just loves them. He just loves little puppies and kittens. And so they're all like in Squatchmo's secret lair. Um Yeah, yeah, yeah. Broken into supermarket. Oh my god, that's so good. Okay, so the 7-Eleven got broken into and all the snacks got stolen. Uh, cops come to someone's house to warn them that there's been a rash of uh, missing pets, etc. Keep an eye on your kids. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so good. That's so, so good. Poor Sam Squanch. Um, yeah. So that's, that's good for the intro to the mystery. I could use any of these. And then when we get to solving the mystery, it's in sort of two parts, right? So... There are locations. Uh, I'll write down some locations. We'll write down some clues, and then we'll talk about what might lead us to the, the solution. So I think that there's some there's some parts here. There's going to be what's actually going on in town. I swear I saw a Sasquatch, meeting the Sasquatch, learning that the Sasquatch needs to go home, right? Communicating with the Sasquatch. He's going to draw with some magic markers, like Mrs. Sasquatch, and then like, ooh, the scary loop where they hurt us. And one of the kids is going to be like, I know that place. That's the lab where my uncle works, right? Oh, snack cakes. Yeah. So let's talk about locations. So locations in our in our game uh, are... Oh, my God. This is so fun. I love doing GM prep with, with y'all. It's so much more fun than doing it alone. Um, here, let me, let me increase my screen in triplicate so I can roll down. Um, Sam Squanch. He's the best. He's everybody's friend because he's the best. Okay, so uh, locations. Oh my God, I gotta change these fonts. They're killing me. Okay, all right. So locations. Um, oh, let's look at the map. You want to look at Thunder Bay? Should we look at Thunder Bay? Okay. So here's Thunder Bay, Ontario. This is Thunder Bay. Um, this is Thunder Bay, Ontario. Uh, I chose Thunder Bay in part because it's like, here, here's where it is. In case you did not know, Thunder Bay, Ontario, slightly to the northeast of Minnesota, kind of in the middle of Ontario. There's Thunder Bay. If we zoom way in here, we can see that it's, you know, just a little ways west of such exciting places as Herkut and east of Finnmark or Shabakwa or Kakabeka Falls. It's in the Slate River Valley. So this is this is Thunder Bay, dear sweet Thunder Bay, birthplace of my dad. Um, and I like I like it because I think that the loop is based around exciting Mission Island, Mission Island, where the Thunder Bay generating station sits. So yeah, this is the entrance to the loop. This is like where the loop is, McKellar Island and Thunder Bay uh, generating station. That's that's the jam. Um, these kids probably go to St. Patrick High School. Uh, I think it's a Catholic school, though. I don't know where there's, like, public schools around here. But look, we got the Nebbing McIntyre Floodway. Northwood Park Plaza Mall. Look at all this great stuff. The Victoriaville Civic Center. Fort William, historic Fort William Gardens. <laughs> right? So the other thing is too is like look how close it is to wilderness, right? There's this huge thing that they can they can escape to. Oh, it's right near Paintball Mountain. So you can yeah, like we can we can have them escape from Thunder Bay Generating Station from Mission Island uh, out that way. So some locations. Uh, let's let's pick a couple of streets. Um, let's say the Seven Eleven on the corner of Ridgeway. And Marx. That sounds too communist. Selkirk and Murray. Yeah, there you go. All right. So the 7 Eleven on the corner of Selkirk and Murray. I'm going to pop back over. The 7 Eleven on the corner, Selkirk and Murray. Uh, obviously, uh, the, what was it called? The Thunder Bay. Um, Uh, 
something station, generating station, Thunder Bay generating station, and St. Patrick High School. St. Patrick High School. Now, where are the woods where the, the Sam Squanch is hiding out? Um, where should the where should the Sam Squanch be be secreted away? Let's find some woods. Um, hmm. <laughs> Do we want to go north of town? I think it makes sense for the Sam Squatch to be somewhere down here, like uh, north, south of City Road, like this this patch of, yeah, just off off City Road somewhere. So the the Sasquatch snuck into town. Sasquatches have a natural stealth field. That's why they're that's why they're experimenting on them. How how do we know? How do we know? And yeah, maybe maybe the Sasquatch like yeah hides out in in a yeah he's trying to get back to his family in Wisconsin but he can't um okay cool yeah maybe he's not he's not in the woods maybe he's in one of these parks let's pick a park <gasps> oh my god a tim hortons the tim hortons on waterloo waterloo plaza mall okay those are going those are going in the list the waterloo tim hortons and what was that mall called waterloo plaza mall And then we need a, uh, we need a, uh, we need a, a park. And I know that this is all modern and not the eighties, but I don't care. That's a golf course. Uh, how about this park? Vickers park. Ah, it seems so, it seems so small. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe if we go further away. Ah, but then it's all like way out in the in the the outside areas. Let's yeah, let's just pick a park. I'm okay with that. It would also be cool if he was staying in the golf course. The golf course is kind of funny. You know what? Fuck it. Let's just do it. Chapel's golf course. It's got a bunch of baseball diamonds. It's like right and smack down in the center of the community. Oh, emo drive. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> and it's near the botanical conservatory. Uh, all right. Cool. So the golf course. Oh my god, the Sasquatch lives in the golf course. That's so good. Okay. So what was it called? Uh, the Chapel's Golf Course. Rad. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So we've got some locations. Um, there are usually some sort of clues or suggestions of possible trouble. Clue can be something that someone knows, a thing, a diary, a drawing, tracks in the gravel, things that reveal things. The clues reveal something about the mysteries. They can be connected to each other, uh, or they can be three clues that point in the same direction. A variant is that clues are all necessary to understand the big picture. The kids may find them in any order. So... Yeah, okay. So some clues. Old Man Lundquist. Oh, God, I'm a mangle how I spell this. Q-I-S-T? Is there a V in there? Lundquist? Q-V-I-S-T. Yeah, right. Old Man Lundquist has seen a great hairy whatchamacallit. on uh, in his yard three nights in a row picking his cherry trees uh, let's we need a teenager we need a later uh, a lady name for a teenager um, so let's see uh, popular names 1986 Canada um, I'd have to look up baby names of 1970, right? Like most popular baby names of 1970, cause these are teenagers now. So, uh, what's her name? Jennifer. 
Laura, Susan, Elizabeth, Kelly. Ooh, Kelly's a good one. Okay. So, Kelly McIntosh, who works nights at the 7-Eleven, says some maniac broke the window and she hid in the back. She heard some stuff. So she could be, they could talk to Kelly McIntosh. Um, I think it should only take a couple of clues to find, to find the, um, the, the yeah, we need a couple of clues uh, from maybe like a cop uh, is like, there's a particularly dopey cop looking for, uh, for the Sam Squanch. So let's name, let's come up with a name for him. Um, popular last names, Ontario, 1980s. Let's see if this information is available on the internet. Surnames of Ontario. Yeah, here we go. Here's some good ones. Stevenson, Hayward. Ooh, Officer Hayward. I like that. Officer... Officer Darren Hayward is in charge of the investigation. But... Everyone is just laughing at him. He swears someone's... He swears it's all connected. But nobody will listen. Um, now, the some of the threats here is that there has to be... There has to be some kind of, like, actual... Um, some kind of actual person, someone who knows like a, a, an agent or a professor, a doctor, someone, someone from the loop who knows how wayward Hayward. <laughs> it's too good. And they all sing carry on my wayward son when he's around. Oh, poor Darren. He's probably someone in the group's cousin, right? Yeah. <laughs> poor guy. Okay, so there's probably some kind of agent, uh, yeah, uh, who who knows, but he's not a clue. So in the first kind of act, the the characters, the players will find the 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 Sam Squanch, um, and then they'll they'll need to find a way to. So they figure it out. They figure out like, oh crap, it's it's a it's a guy, um, and then we can. Yeah, and then we get we found the Sasquatch. That'll be the end of that. And then the rest of it will be solving the mystery and then the big showdown. So solving the mystery requires finding clues, digging around at locations, and then leading to uh leading to what they need to do. So they need to sneak in and uh rescue the lady Sam Squanch. Um So let's see. Phase three is the meat of the story, and you can imply many useful methods during this phase. Some mysteries have a divine intervention event that can be used if the kids can't solve the mystery or run out of time. Something helps them solve the mystery. A letter falls out of a book. This is the deus ex machina. Don't use it too much. They can feel cheated. I'm going to try to avoid this one. Oh, my God. That's too good. Dealer Umber, I'm stealing that. I'm using that for sure. Uh, check it out. So the agents that work for the loop... Uh, you can't see this because I'm all my stuff is in the way. The three agents that work for the loop are Agent Gygax, <laughs> Agent Arneson, and Agent Moldvay. <laughs> oh, it's too good. That's so so good. I'm really into it. <laughs> so what do you think, hey, there, uh, Agent Gygax? Oh, I don't know, Agent Arneson. What do you think? Oh my God, that's so, that's so good. Uh fantastic okay all right so anyway uh puzzles and riddles to be solved this will be like can they get the 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 sort of steps of the mystery uh, let's let's write them out so i make these red uh the steps of the mystery are going to be one discover the sasquatch two commune with the sasquatch three um release the sasquatches Okay, so part of commune with the Sasquatch will be like, how do they earn the Sasquatch's trust, right? Uh, to a 
earn his trust, learn his ways, and then they'll find out. He'll te- he'll tell them like, "Oh, Lady Sasquatch, so sad, sad tear." And then he'll draw the loop, and they'll be like, "Oh, we gotta go there and rescue rescue the Lady Sasquatch." I wish I had, I wish I had like eight hours to do this, but you know, we'll we'll make it as close together as we can. <laughs> um, all right, and then. Um, yeah, and so they, they'll figure it out. The clues will be from the Sasquatch. Um, this won't necessarily be discovering the clues, but it will be, like, how they can get the Sasquatch to, like, talk to them. So so I guess these are going to be Sasquatch clues. So these Sasquatch clues. Oh, my God, Agent Gygax. It's too fucking good. Okay, so Sasquatch clues. Um, so they can have like feed, feed the Squatch, earn his trust. Um, the first encounter, he runs away, leaving fur and footprints for the kids to examine, right? Uh, nobody believes you when you say what you saw. So... The, the phases here will be, um, here, let me move this to the end. So the phase will be like, they've got to see the Squatch before they can earn his trust. So like first sighting, what was that? Ah, a huge Sasquatch. Then they see the fur and the footprints. And they're like, oh, we should figure it out. No one will believe them if they try to tell anybody, except maybe they're really nice, like computer, computer class teacher or something. You know, like if they have a favorite teacher, maybe that favorite teacher would be like, oh, you kids, right? Okay, I like that. Feed the Squatch, earn his trust. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. What else can we What else can we use? We can use, uh, I don't think we need a countdown. Um, let's see, uh, retribution countdown for the antagonist. Oh, that, that actually could be a good countdown for the agents of the loop, right? Yeah, let's do a countdown for them. So one, uh, the agents learn that the Sasquatch is still around too. The agents find out the kids are involved. Three, the agents confront the kids directly. Then four, the agents put pressure on the parents. Paranets, parents. Five, the agents find out where the Squatch is. Oh, no. All right, so it's a countdown now. Perfect. The Squatch. Uh, okay, cool. And yeah, there's got to be, like, I've got all these ideas for, like, cool scenes, right? And I guess maybe I should make a note of those so that later if I need a scene. So, scenes. Uh, pretend the Squatch is a person. Ha ha. Right? That's a scene. Um, using the Squatch to solve a kid problem, right? Scare a bully, etc. Um, <laughs> the Squatch becomes captain of the football team. Um, let's see. Something about a school dance where the Squatch wants to come, but he's a Squatch, so he's not invited. Poor guy. Uh, okay. Cool. So those are a few scenes. Oh, um, yeah, some some like that. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect. Okay, so uh, what else? Um, let's see. Oh my God, it could be a Halloween scene. It's pretty fun. I kind of like that one. Halloween scene? Question mark. The squatch is allowed to be out. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, Retribution countdown. We got that. And then the tilt. Something unexpected happens that changes the situation in a fundamental way. This often happens towards the end of phase three and leads to the showdown. So what could we do? What could be a good tilt? Like maybe the, cause the kids, once they discover something or they assume they've discovered something, then there can be a tilt where they're like, nope, it's not this way. It's a different way. 
Um, like the kidnapper is actually a good guy. The old lady unexpectedly gives the kid a reward and asks him to go home without find, having found the missing necklace. Uh, the uncle visiting the kid's family is in fact a robot. Um, the stargazing student must have been lying. It's her blood on the knife. Um, yeah, like I think that's like all of a sudden. The, the, the twist. What could be our twist here? Hmm. everybody's a Sasquatch. Um, ooh, I know what we could do. Here we go. Uh, here's, here's a twist. Um, a scientist from the loop, a scientist from the loop explains to the kids that the, the loop was just trying to help the Squatches because they're going extinct because of pollution. Oh no. So the twist here is that like, no, we're not we're not doing bad things to them. We just had to get them. We just had to like get these two and study them. We're just trying to understand the squatchmos. I help you, kids. Yeah, I love it. Okay, cool. There's our twist. So it's like, no, you don't understand. We're trying to help the noble squatchmo. All right, perfect. So we need our showdown. And I think that the showdown here, our little, our samurai showdown is uh, the kids, maybe with help from the scientist. We need a name for this good guy scientist. Um, I need a good, we're going to need a good name for him. His name can be, let's look at some good surnames. It's got to be like kind of a dopey name. Dr. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Not Dr. Grigori. <laughs> uh, yeah, something Schmidt. Dr. Hender Schmidt. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Dr. Strangelove, no. Dr. Oostler. Yeah, like something like that. Something kind of like, yeah, Dr. Henderschmidt. I like Henderschmidt. That's a good one. Okay. So a scientist, uh, her name is Dr. Eliza Henderschmidt. No, kids, you don't understand. These these poor noble creatures. Oh, that's so good. Okay. Yeah, Henderschmidt's perfect. Thank you. Dr. Eliza Henderschmidt. All right, so the kids, maybe with help from the scientists, maybe not, uh, break the Squatchmos out of, they gotta have a, it's gotta be a family, right? Mom Squatch or Dad Squatch, hard to say. And company, little baby Squatchos. Uh, Break the Squatch Mo's out of the loop facility. And, and yeah, that'll be the big showdown. Because they'll be like, this is where they have to like steal a robot and use it to fight the agents. And the agents and the cops are chasing them. Big car chase on bicycles, that whole thing. This is the big climax scene when they do that. So when they do the, the sneaking away, they'll sneak in, break them out. They'll get, they'll get caught or, or potentially get caught and they'll run. And that'll be the big, that'll be the big end scene. That's our showdown. Um, and then, uh, lastly, uh, the aftermath and I don't have to, I don't have to. So here's the thing. The, the loop people, they want to study the Sasquatches, but the kids, the kids here have to reveal to them. No, no, the Sasquatches, they need to be free. You have to free the Squatch, man. So exactly. The Squatches don't want to be saved. They just want to be free. Eh. It's so good. It's already such a corny 80s movie. I'm so excited. Um yeah, okay, cool. Maybe maybe we get to see Papa Smotch or Papa Squatch get all Papa Squat. Papa Squatch freak out and go all banana apes and like throw a car or something to save Oh, that's so good. That's so so good. Um Oh, the Sasquatch that's free is the Mama Squatch who misses its family and has been babying the pets. 
Ah, that's so good. Okay, all right. So the Squatch is Mama, Mama Sasquatch. And she's got to treat one of the kids, the littlest kid. She's got to pick him up and like, oh my God, treat him like a little Squatch Mill. <laughs> oh, that's too good. That's so, so good. Oh my God. <laughs> all right, so whoever's the littlest kid, the youngest kid, I'm going to make a note, youngest kid becomes... Honorary Squatch Baby. Honorary Squatch Mill. And this, the Sasquatches smell really bad. And you, you don't want to get hugged by a Squatch Mill. Okay. <laughs> Too good. Too pure. Uh, all right. Great. So Aftermath is uh, is just showing the, the everyday like life for the kids. And then we're done. Um, so the thing is, and, and this is what's interesting about this game, is... Let's talk about stats of stuff because I don't need to make up stats for like monsters or whatever, right? The rest of the game, the rest of the game, like the, the details of this, of this game, um, you have NPCs. They're described briefly with their name, but like in the, in the game, uh, like in Apocalypse World and the games that, that came before this, you don't really have to stat them out. Like, cause the kids aren't necessarily going to like be in fights with these people. They're just tricking them. They're, they're overcoming them as an obstacle. People are just obstacles, right? Um, the kids can find items. Items might give them a plus bonus to a certain thing. Um, unless they're made into an iconic item, they're like one use or, or limited use. Um, but it says here, you should be careful about letting NPCs have guns they use against the kids. The players may feel compelled to arm their kids too. The mystery turns into a weird shootout. So here's my rule. I'm saying this right now. No one will ever draw a gun on a kid. There are very few guns around anyway. The agents probably have them, but the Sasquatches can get shot at, but the Sasquatches won't die in a gunfight. If a Sasquatch nobly sacrifices itself, maybe that'll happen, but it won't be Papa, Papa Squatch won't get machine gunned down, right? The, human, the humans get in the way, uh, they're obstacles, in the same way like uh, a high fence is an obstacle. Um... Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it. We're, we're done. We're, we're done and we're ready. Um, so this is going to be so much fun. Uh, Sasquatch adventure. I, I'm really excited. And, and I like that we can, we can tweak the pace up and down, depending on how close we are to the end of the game. Right. So I'm, this is great for a one shot because I can say like, okay, cool. Let's stretch out the, the solving the mystery a little bit, or no, let's move it along. And they, they earn the trust of the, of the Sasquatch. And I figure what we'll end up doing is intro bullshit at the beginning of the episode, half an hour of character creation and in character bullshit, introducing the kids. Part two will be introduce the mystery. Part three will be solving the mystery. Part four will be showdown, aftermath, and change. So we've got about an hour to solve the mystery. Find out who the who the Squatch is in Introduce the Mystery. I think this will time out nicely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. I'm so excited. This is going to be fantastic. So we're, uh, we're going to be doing this game uh, at 4 o'clock uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario time. Uh, one o'clock Pacific on Saturday, uh, June the 3rd. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, just, just go and watch it. This all takes place. All of this stuff is before the show. So, uh, this is all my prep. If you're watching this after the show, I hope it went well. I hope you enjoyed it. So, um, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming and, uh, and helping out everybody. Uh, as I said, I, I like doing creative work more when I can do it with a, a group of other people. We can all do it together. And you've you've given me so much inspiration, so many good little ideas. Uh, I hope that uh, I hope that you look forward to uh, seeing the Sasquatch in action uh, as much as I do. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we will see you on Saturday. Bye. <laughs>